Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder. A uh, little news before we go to Dr. Fine. Uh, first up is I want to thank Zach Levesque from North Point for joining us earlier. After Dr. Fine, we'll have Governor Raimondo's feed. That'll be at 1 o'clock. And at 3 o'clock, the chair of the political science department at the University of Virginia's political science, uh, our friend Jennifer Lawless, talking about everything in Washington, Trump, Biden, and all the latest. So let's go to Dr. Fine. Dr. Fine, thanks so much. Good afternoon, Josh. Nice to be with you again. Okay, so let's go into the numbers. Uh, Rhode Island has uh, been bouncing around, had had a little bit of a streak of a higher number of deaths, but simultaneously had a little bit of a streak of a lower number of cases. That seems to have flipped today. Uh, let's go through all the numbers. Sure. As you said, unfortunately, 14 new deaths. Uh, we're up to 281 new tested positives, but that's taking into account that testing dropped over the weekend um, and there was no testing at the community health center sites as far as I know yesterday, or at least a number of them were closed. So we're not going to see, we're not doing a lot of testing in the places, or we haven't over the weekend been doing a lot of testing in the places where we expect to see most positives. Uh, our ICU numbers continue to drift up. Hospital numbers are down a little bit, uh, but the trajectory is that we still have a disease that's present and present in the community and still spreading in the community. Around the world, we have 1.2 million recoveries. Always a good thing. I like to start with that. Uh, 3.6 million uh, tested positives around the world. Um, and unfortunately, uh, 253,000 deaths. That number is just going to continue. The number of deaths and the number of tested positives both dropped around the nation and around the world over the weekend, but that's mostly weekend reporting. Uh, I suspect uh, in the United States, we're at 1.2 million tested positives um, and now 70,000 deaths, unfortunately. And I think we are likely to experience another 50 to 75,000 deaths by August based on the current rate of reported invested, uh, uh, tested positives. Um, and on the current rate of deaths. So we're at a kind of high plateau where things aren't increasing that much, but they're not decreasing either. Rhode Island continues to do well in terms of the number of deaths of younger people. Not so many, thank goodness, let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, and it doesn't look to me like the pace of, of the spread of disease has changed very much. So uh, Michael Graham, who's a conservative, he kind of made his bones as a conservative talk show host, primarily in Massachusetts, then he went down to Atlanta. But he has an article today that says in the 86 deaths in New Hampshire, only three are under the age of 60. Um, your thoughts on that? And uh, should that, S similar data came out of Massachusetts functionally that almost everyone had a, who died under the age of 60 had a pre-existing health condition, however that is defined. Uh, are we not thinking through this as effectively and transitioning enough on how we should handle this disease? Well, you know, it's an interesting and open scientific question, because certainly that's the pattern we've seen in New England. Certainly it's true in Rhode Island, and it's been, you know, sort of a little reassuring, though. You don't want elders to die. You have to understand that you know, we have a concept called uh, years of uh, productive life lost um, and, or years of potential life lost. And those years are small among the elders and large among younger people. So much of our energy is making sure that we protect people who have years of productive life in front of them. And that hasn't been a huge challenge. On the other hand, I think it's very possible that social distancing gave us some advantages in protecting people. I've talked about viral load, and we don't have any science behind this. Um, but I, I think a number of people have the sense that the, the, the smaller what's, of what's called the viral inoculum, the, 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 the smaller uh, size of, of disease you get exposed to when you get exposed, might have some impact on 
on disease outcome and on the severity of illness. So that, uh, so that in New York, we saw way too many young people dying. In Italy, we saw way too many young people dying. Uh, let me go to the, the second issue. Uh, we're looking at which colleges and universities are uh, thinking about holding classes. A, a number of schools, significant schools, I believe University of Alabama, I think it's Purdue, have said, we're going back to school in the fall. Uh, and they've made that statement publicly. Bryant University in Rhode Island has functionally said, we're going back to school in the fall. We'll make some adjustments. Um, um, colleges and universities are known as germ factories. Um, uh, things spread quickly at colleges and universities, whether it's the flu or other, other viruses and diseases. Uh, what you're thinking about that as we speak on May 5th? Well, you know, it's a classic challenge. You're exactly right that uh, army barracks or military barracks and colleges and universities are the places where we see difficult outbreaks of things like meningitis and other infectious diseases. And, you know, I think of elementary schools as the petri dish for disease transmission. So that, you know, I worry that when we open schools again, if we haven't really tamped this disease down, you know, six or eight weeks later, we're going to see outbreaks in schools. I think it's a risk. You know, it's, it's just a risk and there's no two ways about it. You know, I think if I were a college president, I would be trying to arrange testing of everyone weekly um, and be willing to close a dorm or, you know, move in quickly if I see an outbreak um, because I think there may be some. You know, and on the other hand, you don't want to put the lives of all our young people on hold forever and ever. Yeah. And we can't say with certainty how long this is going to be. The tensions are real, but I think we have to put science to work, use intelligent testing and rapid, clear, decisive uh, uh, intervention um, when a problem breaks out, as there will be some. Let's talk about modeling and, and the science. Uh, modeling might be the hottest button issue in the United States right now. Uh, the governor finally, after delays and delays, issued a model. That model has proven to be 100% incorrect. <laughs> At every level, that model is wrong. Uh, the University of Washington model, which seems to be an influencer to a number of folks around the country, including the White House, CDC and the task force have said that's one of the data points they looked to, has now updated its projections and said, listen, we're going to be more towards, you know, uh, 100. They were only off by 50 percent. They were only off by 50 percent. There's supposedly another model at the White House being evaluated that sees this going at a, at a higher pace as the country opens up, jumping up to 3,000 cases from about 1,750 on average right now, up to 3,000 cases a day for the foreseeable future and a significant increase in deaths. Um, what, what's the purpose of modeling and what's, how should the reader, viewer, consumer, member of the public analyze these things uh, uh, in their daily life and what should they look to? Man, I, I think it's sort of like listening to a weather report. You know, the 10-day the out weather report isn't good for much. The weather unless, report for unless, unless it's by John Giorsi, and then it's right. dead on. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, just want, I just want to make that correction. If it's John give, Giorsi, give, it's right. Given that qualifier, in general, the weather report for tomorrow is usually reasonable. And I think that's the, the, the truth of all this stuff. You know, the University of Washington was way far off, as I sort of thought it would be. But, you know, I don't have any magic either. The disease is a fierce taskmaster. And, you know, the things that determine it are not our models. The models messed up totally in terms of predicting the need for ventilators. You know, if you remember a month ago, we were running around looking for ventilators and, it turned, and hospital beds, and it turned out we didn't need as many, and, and I was wrong about that because we were using data that was drawn from Wuhan and now it looks pretty clearly like the Chinese cooked the books. You know, so you, 
you know, it's none of it's perfect. It's kind of a vague direction. Um, and I think the data today is the data that matters um, for tomorrow. Right. Um, so I, you know, and I, I don't think we should trust it beyond that. There's certain things we know about how disease progresses, how viral disease progress. And we need to understand that and, and respect it. So when CDC first said, well, gee whiz, you can't transmit this disease if you're not symptomatic, a bunch of us were looking around and scratching our heads because that is not like disease. So guess what? This disease can be transmitted if you're, symptom if you're not symptomatic. Guess what? This hasn't been publicly discussed, but I'm pretty sure there's something called asymptomatic carriage, which means people who aren't sick at all and don't probably don't even have detectable disease, carry a little bit of the disease in their nasal passages and can, can transmit it. You know, this is just not that different from everything else we've done. That's how I'm, I'm willing to guess that because of the character of the immunogenicity of coronaviruses in general, that when we get a vaccine, it will be a two or three or four shot vaccine. We're not going to get vaccinated and get everybody better all at once. That's because it's just going to behave like diseases behave. And that's what we ought to respect. And that's actually where it makes a lot of sense for, from a public policy perspective to put a lot of weight on the, the words of experienced infectious disease experts and experienced epidemiologists, you know, who kind of have a sense in their bones about how diseases work and maybe a little less about the policy people who are trying to learn this from a book, you know, studying from last night's experts' reports. Yeah. Uh, um, could we be in this exact same position three months from now? In other words, we're in May. Could in August, beginning of August, could we be at 300 new cases, 15 to 25 deaths, uh, 400 people in the hospital, 80 to 100 in ICU, and this just becomes uh, Groundhog Day every day? I don't think so, actually. I think it's going to turn to burn itself out a little bit. And, you know, the disease will spread at a level determined by our level of social distancing until it goes through the population and infects those people who haven't been infected and are susceptible based on, you know, what we call host defenses, you know, on, the, on their own health and based on how much, how active they are. And as we, we make people more active, then more people will get exposed. But I think what's going to happen is the disease will tend to taper off at the end of May or in the middle of June somewhat. It won't go away. It'll bubble along. And then, like I said, I, I think we ought to anticipate another outbreak uh, late October, the beginning of November, after kids go back to school, which is when diseases get spread. I mean, you know, we know that the flu gets spread at Thanksgiving and Christmas when people get together and go from coast to coast. This is just not rocket science. So we're going to have that. The, the challenge and the opportunity is, is for us to be thoughtful about what we know. So we know that we get a flu break, uh, outbreak every year. The flu changes year by year. We usually get to 5 to 10 percent of the population uh, infected. Um, and uh, we can predict that. What we have done poorly is immunizing the population. So shame on us if we don't get 90 percent of the population immunized this fall instead of our usual 37 or 42 percent, which doesn't really get us any kind of herd immunity. So, you know, this stuff is predictable. Expect another outbreak next next fall. You know, I'm hoping we'll get some dropping off in, in uh, September or October, in, in uh, uh, July and August, but then a recurrence in September, October, November, mostly October and November. You know, it's what diseases do. When we get testing, if we get testing down, that we know who's had it previously versus who has not, will we then de facto have uh, Plessy versus Ferguson? Will we have two, two clubs? You know, you can go to this nightclub if you've had it, and you can go to that nightclub if you haven't, um, uh, separate and, and equal. I mean, how are we going to sort of decipher the next step in our society? 
Josh, you're breaking up a good bit, so I hope you get this. But um, I, I think we will be able to let people who have tested positive and are immune move around a little more. But I think we're going to want to keep people over 60 or over 65 from moving around much until we get ourselves uh, a good vaccine. I, I think that's the only strategy that really makes sense to me. And then we need very targeted and very robust with backbone interventions when we get outbreaks. We need to shut down the places where the outbreaks are, not just because they need to be disinfected, but because the disease is circulating in that community of people and we need to let them heal, we need to let them recover so they stop transmitting the disease before we open that place up again. But we need enforcement and enforcement with backbone. Uh, Dr. Fine, last word to you. Uh, what do people need to know today? Um, as I keep saying, keep doing what everyone is doing. I think this is the opportunity uh, to work on and think about how we, 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 how we rebuild our trust of each other and our comfort being together. You know, Tom Seguros, who's a, a brilliant guy, um, ran for, for, I think, Treasure a couple of years ago, wrote a piece the other day about, uh, about, about civic trust. And I think it's something we really ought to pay attention to so that we do things to help each other, um, to take care of the segments of the population that need care most and rebuild our trust and confidence in each other that way. That's what we need to be thinking about. Dr. Michael Fine, thank you so much. As always, great having you on board. Uh, for everyone else, Governor Raimondo, 1 o'clock, Jennifer Lawless at 3 o'clock. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Please stay safe. Thanks, Josh.